Well, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for the late start. Had a little technical issue with my audio, but we got it figured out. Um, joining us here, well, I'm Dylan Maldry again for Joe Lucy today, who's out playing hooky um, this week. So um, we have Tom um, C. Midas from Advisors Excel AE Wealth Management, um, cheap investment or cheap investment up there. Um, I guess we'll run through the obligatory compliance slide here. Uh, we're not attorneys, CPAs, and like that. Um, um, so um, I guess, Tom, why don't we start uh, kind of a little bit of your background, what your role is, and, and, and um, kind of we'll go into a little bit of a recap of what we saw here in the first quarter of the year and kind of what's changing and what are we looking at going forward? Sure. Thanks, Dylan. Um, hi, everybody. Hope everyone's having a great start to their week. Uh, so I'm Tom Ciamatis, as Dylan said. Uh, I am the Chief Investment Officer at AE Wealth Management. I've been at this for about 30 years or so. Uh, I've done everything from uh, portfolio analysis to management to trading to, uh, uh, you know, doing customer relations, you, you know, you name it. Um, I've done pretty much all there is to do in the investment side of the business. Uh, primarily. Uh, mostly in the institutional space. I've managed mutual funds. Um, so I've got a quite a varied background, but one of my favorite things that I love doing is I enjoy, um, I enjoy spending time with, uh, with the end users and, you know, with, with uh, advisors and clients and trying to make heads or tails of the markets. Um, I'm a pretty direct person. Um, as my bio will read there, um, I was an infantry officer. So, you know, there's pretty, there's nothing really, to uh, to f finesse as an infantry officer, you know they tell you where do you need to go, and you you know follow your map, and you take your people there, and you get stuff done. So um, you know that's the, my approach to the market. Like this, you know, listen, everyone's smart out there. You've all got careers. You've uh, you've worked hard for your money. Um, you know, and, and despite whether you're a lawyer, or whether you're a doctor, or whether you're an engineer, you've all got sort of your own internal language. Uh, you know, investments are is no different. It's the same sort of. Uh, you know, closed. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of jargon, a lot of things like that. And I, you know, I don't, I don't buy that because I think that creates inefficiency and confusion, and you know, sort of breaks down barriers to communications. So I love to just chat with advisors, tell them what I think, tell them what I see in the markets, tell them how they should sort of treat, uh, you know, the events that that are unfolding before them, and and you know, hopefully, um, again, you know, besides your health and your family, like the most important thing. Is probably your your financial stability and and you know all the goals that you want to achieve. Uh, so I think that's a hugely important sort of third leg to the stool. Uh, so it's important that you're knowledgeable and you're engaged uh, with with your investment plan uh, going forward. So that's a brief one, uh, you know, brief sort of you know ten thousand foot view of uh, my background, Dylan. So I guess we'll just jump into what happened in the first quarter. Um, is that that okay? Yeah, let's just kind of recap. Yeah. And I don't awesome. Any so I have a few things I want you to kind of comment on, but we'll we'll kind of recap and go from there. So the first quarter was was uh, pretty good. I mean, it's been pretty strong uh, since pretty much last summer. After you know we sold off in the uh, in the pandemic, which uh, you know ended last uh, not the pandemic, but the sell off ended on the twenty third of March of last year. We've been on a pretty steady run back upward. I think I saw somewhere today that the uh, Stock market's up, or the S and P at least is up in the neighborhood of about eighty percent since um, last March. So uh, it was it was a nice run. Uh, it was a good time to be disciplined because uh, a lot of folks sort of folded their tent and went away, and then missed missed the back the run up back up. So you know I'm not going to bore you guys with you know the election and the results and all that stuff. And kind of what we had was you know this new administration take uh, take the reins in uh, in the first quarter. Um, toward the end of January and boy, uh, have they taken the reins. It, it's well, I don't know that you say they, they've taken the reins. They've kind of taken the checkbook <laughs> and uh, they've, they have been spending money like, uh, like drunken sailors. And, and uh, you know, again, there's a lot of questions surrounding how this stuff is going to get paid for uh, who it's going for, what the actual benefit is, but you know what? The market didn't really care. I mean, the market just saw the fact that there was all this money and all this cheap liquidity and the Fed was going to keep rates low. And really, you know, when you're, when, and I'm sure a lot of you folks, you know, do look at, at mortgage rates and, 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 you know, what you get for a CD, 
uh, you know, rates are super low. So, you know, in the absence of an alternative, the market has been the beneficiary of this sort of, uh, you know, rush to make money. And so, you know, we've seen a lot of silly things in the first quarter. I mean, some of that GameStop nonsense that occurred, you know, you see the Bitcoin going through the roof. I mean, there's just a lot of really strange things that are going on. And the market just seems to continuously just shrug off, um, you know, these sort of, you know, in my view, are, are huge warning signals, right? I mean, I think that, that, you know, when you're, the government is spending, you know, trillions upon trillions of dollars, uh, you know, in printing money, uh, you know, you have a lot of uh, overt speculation out there. Um, you know, it, it just it doesn't feel right to me. Again, you know, feeling maybe is not something that, that's super quantifiable. But after, you know, nearly 30 years of this stuff, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it gets to the point where you're kind of like, you know, how far are we from pets dot com in, in, you know, 1999 or, or you know, the the mortgage bubble that, that, that we saw where people were getting those ninja loans, you know, no jobs, uh, no income. Um, you know, that's, again, if you got out, you were hurt, right? Obviously, because the market has been moving super strongly, uh, you know, even April, I mean, we were up, what, 5% on the S&P. So, um, you know, that said, I'm not saying that everything is hunky-dory from here on out. We had, you know, last quarter, uh, GDP came out last week, it was 6.4%. I'd heard there were estimates anywhere between 8 and 10%, but it was only you know, 6.4, which would be great under any normal circumstances. But the fact that all this money went out to people and the largest component of that GDP growth was consumer spending. Um, My question is, like, are we going to send more money to people in the next three months and the three months after that? And then they're going to keep running out there and spending. And I don't know if folks have noticed, but, you know, like the toilet paper thing was a funny thing, right, where, you know, people hoarded that. They didn't have, uh, you know, supplies of that. I don't know if people are, are hunters or shooters out there, but you notice that there's a, there's a huge ammunition shortage out there. So, you know, those are kind of two little bellwether things that you may look at. But how many other things are out there from building supplies, from people that are remodeling homes, car prices are, are going crazy. Um, so, you know, there's all those sort of, you know, bells and whistles that are that are flashing yellow out there that are telling me that, you know, look, you keep giving people money who are sitting at home and not working. They're still consuming. They're not producing, they're consuming. So, you know, if you look at basic economics, you know, that clearly tells me that there continues to be demand for everything, but it's not being made. So at what point in time do we get to, to a place where, and this is probably a logical time to, to stop Dylan and, and get to some of, some of your questions, Do we start seeing pressure on prices? And it doesn't matter how much money you've got if it just costs a lot more to buy the basic things that you have been buying all along. Yeah, and and you mentioned low rates, all this liquidity, the stimulus, all this money that's in the economy. Now it seems like inflation is going to be even a bigger concern than it ever has been. Just with coming out of the pandemic, people are going to be, again, whether they have the money or not, they're going to go spend money. And what is that going to do inflation? How does that affect the markets? How do you see that uh, kind of playing out the next six to 12 months? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, 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 I was blown away that one of the key mandates or one of the two key mandates for the Fed is to, you know, manage inflation. And then the other one was supposedly this came out after 2008 was that, you know, they were they were pursuing full employment. Well, you've got jobs that are available out there, but people can't fill them or they can't find candidates to fill mm-hmm. the jobs. And now the Fed is saying that, well, they're going to let things run and any inflationary pressures we have are going to be transitory. So I don't understand how you, once you squeeze that toothpaste out of that the tube, I don't know how you get that back in because, you know, look, it didn't take a whole lot to spook the market other than, you know, hey, supply chains were interrupted and then mm-hmm. we shut down overnight and you saw what that did to the market. Now what's going to happen if all of a sudden you get into an environment where you start having accelerated you know, price increases, the Fed isn't going to be able to stand back and say, well, we're going to do an orderly sort of transition by raising some rates. They, you know, Remember, I don't know if you, if you recall, but, but in 08, when Lehman was, was collapsing, 
um, you know, the Fed met over the weekend and they were like, oh, we're going to cut rates by 1%. percent like, the world is burning and you're going to get together on a weekend and cut rates by 1%? whoop de doo So my fear is that the Fed is going to get lost sort of in this rush. Now, folks may may only look at the Fed and say that, well, that's the only place that, 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 that rate increases would come from, right? That's not true. When you think about it, the market makes a big, you know, has a big impact on whether rates go up or not. And then what I'm looking at is, for example, if you look at a situation like where the government is spending a lot of money, as an look, think of it on individual terms, right? If you have a big credit card balance, the odds of you getting approved for a loan, or if you have a lot of debt outstanding, the odds of you getting approved for a loan are pretty slim. And if you do get approved for a loan, guess what's going to happen? You're going to pay a pretty high rate. So that's my fear is that the market's going to step in and say, you know, when the government wants to issue more debt, they're going to say, well, we don't want the 10 year one and a half percent. We want it at two and a half. Well, voila, there go your rates. They just went up and the Fed had nothing to do with it. So the Fed can play around with the short term rate all it wants. And in normal times, it can adjust itself and, and sort of, you know, tweak things here and grease the wheels a little bit there. But once the train starts, you know, like once you lose your brakes and you're heading downhill, there's no, you know, there, there's nothing you can do, but just try to just manage that scary ride. So that's mm -hmm. my concern is that it's not going to be transitory. We're going to see price increases. They're going to stick. And then people are going to be shocked. And then it's just going to be a lot more expensive to do everything, uh, you know, by way of, of your normal life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as we, you know, we get to the end of the pandemic, wherever we're at right now, depending on what inning or what uh, what we're going to look at there, how much of the this opening up and the vaccine coming out, how much do you see with the stock market being a forward looking indicator that, you know, how much of the opening up that's going to happen going forward is already maybe priced into the market and, you know, all these companies that are, you know, these high stock prices that really aren't very good companies and, you know, kind of how does all that play out from, from your, uh, from your aspect? Yeah. So that, so that's a good question. The, the reopening trade actually started, you know, when they first announced that there were going to be vaccines. Right. And that was like shortly, like a week or two after the election. And, uh, you know, the market started factoring that in, right? That, you know, vaccines were going to become available. They were going to get rolled out. People were going to get vaccinated. And eventually, you know, it was going to make its way through the population and we were going to reopen. Now, some states have been more hesitant than others to sort of to, to open back up. But I think by and large, that trade is done at this point. I saw something this morning that said something like two out of every five American Americans have been vaccinated. I know they were, the other week they were saying that there were 200 million doses. So at some point in time, it's like we're going to we, we're going to get where we're going to get. OK, and so at, at the end of this thing, it's like how much more reopening can occur? And I'm saying not much because, you know, yes, you have places like New York City that are going to mm -hmm. open up July 1st and you have, you know, Los Angeles and a couple of other major metropolitan areas. But by and large, you know, the rest of the country is is fairly open. I know here in Kansas, I mean, you know, we live in probably in the most um, liberal leaning uh, county uh, in a pretty conservative state, but they finally lifted their mask mandate, you know, on May 1st. So it's done here. It's pretty much in the Midwest, except for the, the big cities, it's pretty much done. So if you look at the stock market as a forward looking mechanism, you're looking at where it's probably looking about six months ahead. And so when that translates into, you know, what the economy is going to look like six months, hey, we got 6.4% GDP growth, okay? Barring any other additional stuff, we probably won't get 6% in the second quarter. We'll probably get something less. We'll probably get something less even after that, and we'll kind of limp into the end of the year, you know, right around the 2% the range. So, uh -huh. you know, that's, that's the challenge is I think what we're doing by borrowing all this money and spending all this money now is we're basically taking away from future spending and future projects so there's there's always it, it you know whether you do it on the front end or you do it all along or whether you do it um at the end it's all sort of you know it all sort of evens out and i think we're on this i think we're going to be on this downward slide as as the year progresses um simply because we just can't sustain this level of spending and government spending on top and individual spending as well yeah, and I think you you know you look at the government. I mean, is there really? 
mean, Biden's talk about he's basically promising to raise taxes. He says his numbers, you know, the $400,000 mark. Um, it doesn't seem the market really is all that concerned about, you know, any potential changes in tax code or, you know, even regulation. But I mean, eventually you think it's going to have to catch up here as we get the, the year done. But is there anything you could see coming out of the White House or Congress that, you know, would affect the markets significantly other than, I mean, it doesn't seem like even the problem of raising taxes has really affected anything. Well, you know, raising the taxes is, is not really something that they'll understand until they, until it bites them. Right. Because at the end of the day, you know, they come out with these proposals, like they were going to raise the capital gains tax to whatever it was, 40% and individual tax rate. I think wall street, uh, likes to play this sort of game where they think that they're smarter than everybody else. And they seem to think that if we throw enough lobbyists at it and throw enough money at these politicians, that we're going to, you know, knock these things down. So if we take our corporate tax rate from 21 and they're saying, you know, it should be much higher than that should be in the thirties, you know, we could somehow massage this thing down to a little bit higher, but not what it is. We could do the same thing with income tax. I, I don't think we're dealing with this type of, uh, um, you know, it's not the same sort of, you know, tune that's been played through the years. I think you have a highly idealistic Congress and a, a president that, that, you know, basically kowtows to, to their leadership. And so I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of backing up. And, that, and, and, and why should there be? Because they're controlling both both houses of Congress and the White House. So, you know, I think Wall Street may be in 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 sort of in a state of shock when they realize that all of a sudden, you know what, these taxes are real. They're going to be at these levels, and they're not going away, and we can't chip away at them. So that's my 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 bigger my my biggest concern is that you know they're sort of ignoring that right now and just sort of you know they like the song that's on the radio and they're dancing at the party right now. And they don't realize that, you know, at any minute, somebody might turn off the lights and throw them out. So that's that's a challenge. And, and listen, I mean, for me, I think what's going to derail the economy is, you know, just continuous spending on the part of the government, continuous pushing of, um, you know, agenda items that, that maybe are not, uh, you know, beneficial to, to everybody. They're beneficial to some folks. And I think it's really more of a policy uh, mistake on their part where they just misread the room and just keep on piling it on as long as they can. And then when they realize that it's too much, it's been overdone. And then the other thing is that, that concerns me is that if the Fed finally realizes that, you know, this potential inflation that we're looking at isn't transitory, do they just snap back and, and, you know, just start raising rates? And the minute you start seeing rates go up, I mean, I think a magic number on the 10 year is about 2%. If we mm -hmm. get close to that, you're going to have some serious um, volatility in the markets because now all of a sudden you're going to start seeing alternatives to the stock market. And, you know, let's face it, people have had a really great run. They're going to start looking to try and bank some of that. You know, they just can't expect this type of growth um, to persist indefinitely. Yeah, I mean, as you see, I mean, the, with inflation and everything that we're looking at, I guess, where's a, a good alternative or where do you see, I mean, it's going to affect the stock market differently, but is there commodities or some other place that would maybe benefit from that? Yeah, that that's always difficult because, you know, you can always find sort of the traditional places that are going to be um, not correlated with the market and they're not going to track the market. But the problem is, is, We've in the the last few sort of downturns that we've seen, whether it was in eighteen or last year, um, and even oh eight was sort of the, the the first harbinger of that. It's like there's no place to hide. I mean, I remember the joke uh, back in um, back in oh eight was that you know you had there were two positions you could be in. There was one was cash and the other was fetal. So uh, you know that that's the challenge, right? At the end of the day, is is um, you can methodically try and prevent any kind of decline in the stock market. But at the end of the day, all of those assets miraculously are going to become very correlated for a very short amount of, for, for, for in a very short order. And the challenge there is going to be that you can't get out of that, you know, sort of falling rock fast enough because that, that rock is about a block wide 
and it's about 20 feet off your head. So you will get crushed. So, so my thought is for folks that are over leveraged, if you've had a great run, fantastic. You know what? You've stayed at the roulette table a little bit longer than you should have. So to me, it's like if you have a plan and that plan is sound and it's still achieving your goals, then you should persist in, in implementing that plan. Now, if you're, you know, 70 years old and you've got 90% in equities, that's not a good plan. But, you know, my hope is that in these good times that people come see folks like yourself very clearly, soberly, just go over what their goals are and make sure that their plans are implemented. And if you're out of whack because the market's done great, then I would rebalance back to what your target, you know, allocation should be and be happy that you had a really, you know, really good run. Uh, but, you know, it, it won't last. And, and my argument isn't just to cash everything out and run for the hills. No, that's not. I mean, the other the, the way the way you guys and, and, and the good thing about having a financial advisor is you're probably planning for you know increments right if you're 25 years old i'm not going to tell you to do anything just you know the market will be higher when you're 60 trust me that'll happen it's it's a virtually a foregone conclusion but if you're close to retirement or if you're in retirement you know you should have enough money on hand to get you through two or three years you should have you know money after that to take advantage of the market coming back and growing again and making sure that your buying power isn't eroded by um by inflation and then beyond that you know what kind of legacy do you want to leave for your kids or or your grandkids so you know those are this is a wonderful time to sit down with uh, with an advisor and go over your plan and again don't make it about the minute by minute because you're going to drive yourself crazy. I have to watch the nonsense on TV every day because that's my job. Uh, but, you know, if if I wasn't in that position, I would turn around and say, listen, you know what? They have to fill 24 hours of content. Good, bad, and different. They've got to put something on TV. And if you watch that stuff, it'll drive you crazy because on any given day, you will see vast amounts of contradiction. What you should do, what you shouldn't do, what you should have done, what you, you know, so filter that noise out and what you should really focus more on is am i achieving my goals and am i on track for my goals and like i said this has been a really great opportunity to you know shore up uh, you know your situation and if you are out of whack then go ahead and rebalance back to you know your your preferred risk tolerance in your in your proper allocation yeah, I think we should have an offer up there if you want to schedule a call with an advisor here. And if you're a current client of ours, uh, revisit your plan. Um, make sure it is in order. Um, if you're not uh, and have questions about your current situation, feel free to um, schedule that call uh, with an advisor here on the team. Uh, let's see about one more question here, Tom. Uh, Bill wants to know, is there any specific stocks such as GE that might be of value if the current infrastructure bill passes into law? Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of companies, more traditional companies that would benefit, you know, whether it be GE or Caterpillar, or, you know, you name it. I mean, some of the more sort of like more uh, traditional and, and I don't want to call them boring, but, you know, they've been around for a long time. Right. And if they're involved in building bridges or they're involved in, uh, you know, any type of construction, I mean, that, that if, if that if the bill passes, in in its in the current state, yeah, they'll all benefit from that. But I think some part of it needs to pass because I'm like a lot of people, just baffled by what is considered infrastructure in this bill. <laughs> like I'm old school, right? So I'm kind of like, hey, bridges, roads, you know, maybe you rebuild a, a school or something. But you know, w when there's other stuff in there that has nothing to do with it, that's the part that kind of you know confuses me and, and, and creates frustration on my part. But yeah, I think um, any of those sort of um, old school uh, manufacturing companies or, or, you know, companies that would be considered infrastructure. I mean, I generally don't don't follow stocks individually, but yeah, that would be that would be a solid one. If if again, if the valuations are there. Right. Because I mean, mm -hmm. it all boils down to, you know, if GE is trading at, you know, 30 percent of, of its historic value, then I would say, yeah, that's a logical connection. Right. But if it's already been factored in and it's already trading above its its historical value by a multiple, 
I would probably avoid it because, you know, again, they'll probably not achieve everything that's in the bill. They'll achieve some part of it. But, you know, again, with higher interest rates, maybe their earnings or, or higher corporate tax rates as well. Um, you know, maybe their earnings will be pinched because now they won't be as profitable or, or as attractive as they may have been, you know, under 21 percent corporate tax rate. Yeah. Um, any other questions in the chat here? Um, doesn't look like it. Um, so any closing thoughts, Tom? Yeah, I, I can't reiterate, honestly, uh, how the importance of, of making sure you're engaging uh, with um, with Dylan and, and the team there uh, at Joe at Joe's um, Joe's shop because um, this is exactly the time where you need someone who's engaged and basically is driving the car for you. We're gonna it's so it's been so busy, uh, it's been crazy with all of this like sort of you know pandemic and what's going on and you know the, the economy being in the state that it's in and what's happening with you know schools and things along those lines um you know it's easy to lose sight of that but you know these these times really call for a lot of vigilance and you know the way i would structure it and think about it is think of joe's team and dylan and, and the rest as sort of your financial health care provider right i mean you don't want to go to the doctor when you're when you're you know on death's door. You want to go and get a routine checkup. You want to make sure you're engaged. You're, you know you, they're telling you that you know you're on track. Everything's fine. Take your meds. Uh, you know whatever. Um, but that to me, I think right now is again. I can't emphasize the fact that we have had like an awesome, awesome run the past year. Mm -hmm. And I would just sit down. And even if even if you feel you're good, just sit down and just get yourself checked out and make sure you're good for the next two to three years. Cause in my, in my view, I think it, it will be a little bit rocky because we just don't know, um, you know, what's in store here, uh, especially with all of these sort of proposals that are hitting the fans. So it, it, it's, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had one last question here and we'll, uh, we'll sign off here, but Jim, uh, Asked if uh, you think the stock market's being held up artificially, how long can we go before it crashes down? Um, is what he's wondering. I know you've kind of hit on that separately, but I guess that's I love, kind of direct to the, the point. So. I love those. I love those uplifting questions, right? I mean, it's like when, when's the world going to go to hell? So, yeah, I, I do think in some respects it is being held up artificially because you really don't have a variety or a, or a, um, a lot of choices of where to go. I mean, if you're going to your bank and you're getting a one-year CD and you're getting half a percent, who's going to put their money there, right? And the fact of the matter is, you know, money keeps being printed out there and there's just more and more money that's flying around. And where's it going? I mean, if you look at things like Robinhood and things like that, um, you know, there's a lot a lot of retail investors out there that are that are goosing the market. Um, there's just a lot of a, a lot of players in there that typically would not be there. So can I give you a time when I think the market will crash? No. I mean, that, that if I could do that, um, I would make two phone calls a year. <laughs> and, and live on an island somewhere, and that'd be yeah. awesome, right? And, and uh, but uh, I mean, look, if if anyone's been around for any amount of time, you know we're going to get corrections, right? I mean, we average like like a ten percent correct, ten percent dip once a year. Every you know three to five years, we we average uh, you know twenty percent drop. So it will happen. These markets just cannot continue going upward. Uh, but at the same time, though, it's it's been remarkable the past two or three months how much the market has ignored what I think as as very strong warning signs. So, um, yeah, I think I think it is in, in some respects being held up artificially by the by the amount of money that's being printed and then the amount of money that's flying around. One, two is do I know when it's going to end? No, but the good thing is it's been working to your favor at this point. So again, I go back to what I said, you know, a half a dozen times during this call. It's 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 you know, take a little off the table and rebalance back. If you're a 50 50 person and now you're 60 40, go back to 50 50 um, because because it'll serve you better, you'll sleep better at night. All right, Tom, thank you uh, for your time uh, today. Um, everyone else uh, will be uh, Joe will be back next Monday. Uh, same time. Hopefully we get started on time uh, next week. Um, but everybody have a good rest of your week and we'll uh, talk to you guys next Monday. Thank you. Take care. Uh, you too.